Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, have some prayer. Jesus, Lord, we are gathered into your name this morning to receive impulses from your throne, grace from your heart, right to us. We pray that you would um, speak the words that we really need to hear, and we trust that you will. But Lord, give, them, give us ears to hear. Seems to be such a problem, Lord, uh, with all of us, including myself. We, we want ears to hear your word, even as you speak to us exactly what we need. Lord, have mercy upon all of us who are here, all who have had a wonderful week, and then all who have had a trying, difficult week, maybe with disappointments, maybe with setbacks, we pray that grace would come to address these things as well. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. I, uh, I came across a, um, a link while I was on my computer the other day that... Um, had a very promising title. It said, um, the top list of things that we use the wrong way. I said, wow, this sounds important. So I clicked it. Sure enough, the top five, or this ranked in the top five things that we use the wrong way are Tic Tac boxes. It's just really extremely important this this is anyway i saw that and realized i had been suckered by clickbait but um went ahead and read it anyway <laughs> i was already there <laughs> okay um tic tac boxes all right you shake them you know how that works right you shake them like crazy and you either get two or you get 71 you know how it works um, the Tic Tac box is actually engineered where the cover is supposed to open and it, it, it dually functions as a slide. One Tic Tac will slide down if you just tilt the box, right? Now, obviously, I'm going to argue with that a little bit and so will you. Who eats one Tic Tac? Especially if they're orange. You're supposed to eat the whole box if they're orange. Um, but anyway, it just shows, I mean, all right, the shaking thing, that works. It's not morally wrong to shake your Tic Tac box, right? But uh, it just shows that we are using it in a different way than it, what it was engineered for. All right. Chinese food takeout cartons. You know, the paper kind that are like this and everybody eats out of the box. Well, believe it or not, those boxes were originally engineered to break down into a small paper plate. They were never meant to be a carton that you're eating out of with chopsticks, but you're supposed to flatten it out and turn it into a paper plate. Now, again, most of us would say, well, I don't want a paper plate. I want something portable. I want to be able to walk around the office at lunch and, you know, show off my chopstick skills and, you know. But again, you're just using it in a way different than what it was meant. Probably around the number 10 spot. In most bathrooms, people are using the wrong plunger. That's right. Do you know the plunger that people use in their toilet was meant for the kitchen sink? Right. If you've got a flat plunger in your bathroom, that is a kitchen sink plunger not a toilet plunger. You know what? The toilet plunger has this like little rubber contour down here that fits. Okay, you, some of you are on board with this. The rest of us are saying whatever works. Okay, and it's true. What, I mean, whatever works. I did this for years. Once I figured out that what I was doing wrong, I did not transfer this to the kitchen sink. I just threw it out. Okay, so you can still come to my house for lunch and stuff like that if I... Each one of these things, obviously, not like misused, but used for something different or less than what it was intended. So this got me thinking, if this is true for these kind of ridiculous items, is there a list 
of things that Christians misuse or use differently than what was intended. Uh, for instance, the Bible and prayer. The Bible and prayer. All right, how do we use the Bible? Well, you we say, well, I, I, I read the Bible to get information about God, and I pray to ask him for stuff. All right, the Bible and prayer. I get my information about God, and then I pray to ask him for stuff. These aren't wrong. These uses for these items are not wrong. They're just, they're just uses that um, use these things at a lower level than what they were intended. So yeah, read the Bible to get information about God, and yes, ask him for stuff. The problem is allowing it to stop there. That's the problem. We can manage, and we often do manage, to appropriate the most powerful tools of grace that God has given us and then convert them all into penny candy. We do. We have a habit. I think human beings have a habit of minimizing everything. You ever know a guy like this? You say, how do I get to... And they say, oh, it's easy. Just get on 270. Oh, I hate those directions. They try to minimize the complexity involved as though, you know, simplicity is some kind of virtue in and of itself. Just get on 270. Well, dude, that might take me like 45 minutes out of the way. Yeah, but it's easy. But that doesn't mean it's right or it's good necessarily. So we Christians have a bad habit of taking really profound things, minimizing them because simplicity is the order of the day and brevity as well and um, make them less than what they really are. All right, so here's what we want to learn this morning. We got to learn to pick up and use the powerful tools of grace that God has provided us for the reason that he has provided them to us. We want to use his powerful tools of grace the way that he intended. Okay? All right, this morning we're going to learn specifically about two so-called tools of grace. We're going to think differently, hopefully, after this morning about prayer and about the Bible, what I just mentioned. The Bible and prayer, wow, two really, really basic and uh, simple things that Christians hear a lot about and they may not do that well with. Um, here's how we're going to learn. We've been in the book of Exodus now for some time. We are well beyond the spot where the Red Sea has been parted. We are well beyond the giving of the Ten Commandments and all the drama and all the forward motion of the narrative has slowed way down. Where God seems extremely concerned about the, the building of his house, which we call the tabernacle. If you're not used to thinking about what this thing looks like, there's the slide. It's a composite, solid, tent fabric object. It's got golden boards in it, and it's also got tent canvas on it. It's hard to just say it's a tent. We refer to it as the tabernacle. Okay, inside of this tabernacle is furniture. This furniture, and this is the cutaway view, this furniture has, God has given specific directions on how to build the items of the furniture in the tabernacle. So look at the things that are there. Obviously, this is the front door over here. You go in the front door, then there's a table loaded down with unleavened bread there. There's light from a lamp stand there. There's the incense altar, which we're going to study this morning. And then in the deepest part, there's the Ark of the Covenant. These all correspond to New Testament spiritual realities. Now, these Old Testament people had no idea what any of this meant, but we know. As New Testament people, we got a completed Bible, and now 
armed with this completed revelation, we can look back and interpret what these things are in light of the Christ who was anticipated at the time. So there's here at the, at the, at, with the bread, we've got Christ is the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, John chapter 6. Here at the lampstand, uh, we are reminded of John chapter 8, where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. All right, then getting into the deepest part, into the presence of God with the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, this, this shows us God in Christ. And we're reminded of Colossians chapter 2 that says all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Him bodily. And John 14 where Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. All of these things are pictures of real spiritual realities of, of which we partake today. That's what it all means here. So the first picture that we're going to get into this morning, because we've already covered a number of these, is the one related to that incense altar way up there, right close to the... Okay, yeah, there you go. Incense altar. And we're going to learn from this that prayer is vital. Prayer is vital. Please turn to Exodus chapter 30. Bear with me here as we go through these verses. These all require a high level of interpretation, but it will be a reasonable interpretation. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 1. Everybody there? Second book, second book of the Bible in chapter 30 and verse 1. And, and here... God says to Moses, you shall make an altar on which to burn incense. That's all you need to know right this second, okay? Why, does, why is God interested in an altar where you burn incense? Why is God interested in smelling something? He's not actually interested in smelling anything. He's interested in the significance of this whole thing right here. So we need to find out what is the significance of burning incense here in the Old Testament? Um, if you look at, you don't have to turn to this, but if you look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Revelation 5, 8 says this. Okay, watch, I'm about to interpret the Old Testament picture using New Testament writing, okay? It says, when he had taken the scroll, that is the Lamb of God had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb each holding a harp, while these elder angels fall down in front of Jesus, and they're all worshiping him, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense. Which are, okay, here's the master key, right? Which are the prayers of the saints. The incense is the prayers of the saints. That is the prayers of all the people of God. That's what the Old Testament picture tells us. Prayer is like incense. All right, show you a little bit more here. Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. says, And another angel came and stood at the altar. Now it's borrowing the pic. Now it's reflecting back on the picture from the Old Testament. Here at the end of the Bible... The writers of the book of the writer of the book of Revelation is reflecting back now on the actual imagery in the book of Exodus. And he says, the angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, which is a flat plate, and was given much incense to offer with what? With the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which is the is in reference to the incense altar, before the throne. So again, incense, prayer, very much connected, very much related in the eyes of God. Okay, Revelation 8, 4. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before the hand of God. Prayers rise. They're like a cloud of incense rising. You got to get this imagery locked in your mind. Otherwise, you will start thinking that prayer is just some um, email that you shoot off into the stratosphere and you hope that there's a response, right? 
Now, you got to get, you got to pick up the biblical picture of it if you really want to understand prayer. Prayer is like a cloud of incense going up before God. It says, the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Now, look what happens in verse 5. Uh, 8 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. So you got this picture prayer going up like incense. Okay, the response fire coming back down to the earth. There's a response. Something going up and then something coming down. He threw it down on the earth and there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. This is prayer in the Bible. Prayer that rises up before the throne of God and it moves him. Lock that picture in. Now, please go back to chapter 30 of Exodus where we are and look at verse 6. Okay? Look at verse 6. It says, in front of the... Okay, this is instructions on where to put the incense altar, when it has been made, all right? Now, we've already seen in the cutaway, but anyway, we're going to show you it again. In front of the mercy seat that is above the testimony where I will meet with you. All right, don't get lost here, but if you look back at this again, it's right in front of the veil that separates you from the deepest, most holy place in the universe. That's where the prayer goes, Think about the placement here. Get the picture of the placement. This shows your experience of prayer is about one step away, one big step away from being in the most holy place in the universe, in the presence of God. Prayer gets you there. Notice that the incense altar is not out 28 miles away and you're you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and... No, it's like you pray and then it's, you're in. That's the picture you're supposed to get here. Prayer is powerful. So the idea of prayer is entering the presence of God begins to come up here. Now watch what happens here because the verse goes on. Verse 7, or the the picture goes on. Verse 7, Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it every morning. Every morning. Right? So the, 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 the Old Testament priest goes, he burns the incense every morning. It, and if you skip down in verse 8, it says, at twilight he shall burn it. It's a regular incense offering before the Lord. It's every morning and every evening. It's not every crisis. Because, you know, that's when you become a great prayer warrior is when you're broke, you got to pay your bills, or you're sick, or something terrible is about to happen, or there's a breakup, or some kind of calamity, and then, oh, Lord, I just, I, I, I just come to you and please do something. Suddenly we turn into a prayer warrior. Listen, prayer is not supposed to be crisis by crisis. God wants you in his presence day by day in a regular way. That's what the picture's showing. That incense should be burned every morning, every twilight, regularly. But there's a reason why we don't. You know, you don't pray regularly. I I doubt that this picture right now fits most of us. We, you know, we'll pray a perfunctory prayer over lunch. Lord, thank you for this food and thank you for this fine day and bless this cheeseburger in your name, amen. And this is what we kind of do. This is our our prayer. Or like I said, there's the crisis prayers. Lord, please do something, please. And then he does something and thank you. I'll talk to you next year. This is kind of the way the prayer life works. For most Christians, we're pretty weak with this. I think partly because we don't understand it. So we just leave it alone. Well, um, we find prayer hard. 
Think about this, the guy or the girl that's on their knees and they're trying to squeeze out the words and they don't even know what words to pray. And, and they close, you close your eyes to pray and then you daydream. You know. <laughs> Listen, I'm cut from the same cloth you all are. Close your eyes, Lord. And then before you know it, you're thinking, I wonder what the weather's like in Paris. You just do that. I mean, these things you don't even think about otherwise, you know. wonder what I will look like at 90. Lord, I'm not looking too good right now, so. Uh, Lord, how did I even get there? We, this, this is what we do, all right? We, we, we kind of drift. Um, we find it difficult to do. You have prayed before and didn't, either did not get an answer at all to your observation, or at least you got an answer that you didn't want. I didn't want that. I didn't ask for that. I did not order that. I want to send it back. Like Amazon. Just the sending back process is just a nightmare. You can't do it. So here are a couple of things that the picture kind of helps make clear. If you've got a difficult prayer life, and this is not your habit for all the reasons that I just said. Okay, look at the picture here. And verse 7 continues to say that the priest shall burn fragrant incense on this altar every morning. When he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. When he dresses the lamps. So if you can imagine, okay, the priest takes care of this big lamp every day. He cuts the wicks on it and he makes sure, makes sure that the oil is in it and all that kind of stuff. And then the, the light goes up and then he turns and then offers incense at that altar. It goes like that. It's in that order. So let's say that this is the lampstand. He takes care. He eats at the showbread table. He takes care of the lampstand and then he offers the incense offering. That's the picture. Now, Light is something that often comes up in us as we're like in the Bible. Light is something that occurs when, hopefully, when we're sitting in the room here and you're not thinking, well, these verses are really hard. What's this guy trying to prove? And you're really open to what's being shared and you feel like, yes, that's true. Or you're alone with your Bible and you got into a verse and you feel like, wow, I never saw that before. Listen, at that moment, the easiest thing for you to ever do in your life is to pray. It's the easiest thing. You pray on the tail of light. So think about this. What would happen if you were going through your reading and you thought, wow, I never realized that before. Hey, pray that. That'll be the easiest prayer you've ever prayed in your life. Like, wow, God really wants to bless me. Have you ever thought about, thank you, Lord, you want to bless me? Easy prayer. That's ABC prayer. That's prayer that's powered by the light of God. Easiest thing ever. Okay, so that's the first thing. You look down a little bit further toward the end of these, verse 10. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns because, you know, the, the altar has a couple of prominent little pointy places on each of its four corners. And the priest was supposed to take blood from the sin offering and put it on those horns, right? He, you should, he shall make atonement on his horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering. What does this signify? The sin offering signifies the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins. Listen, nothing weighs you down worse than unconfessed sin in your life. Sin that you have allowed to be there. And perhaps you're feeding, even as you're trying to pray, you're, you're feeding it. You're excusing it. You've decided to keep it in your life and you refuse to repent and you refuse to confess. You know what? That doesn't mean that God loves you less. It just means your prayer life becomes a casualty. It is really tough to pray and enjoy it and feel like you're in the Lord's presence when sin is allowed to just remain in your life unconfessed, it's, it's instead of like heaving up a cloud of incense, it's like trying to deadlift a blacksmith's anvil. And then somebody says, wow, in prayer, wonderful. No! Never do that again. Hey, sometimes 
we got some things in our life that we need to have a, a Jesus talk about. I said, Lord, okay, no excuses here. I've done such and such a thing. I had a horrible attitude. I had a horrible attitude toward my spouse. We had words. I got out on the highway. I had road rage and, you know, gave somebody half a peace sign out on the road. And I just can't believe that I did any of that. Lord, I'm sorry. I got a horrible attitude. I've seen some things I shouldn't have seen. I said some things I shouldn't have said. I went some places I shouldn't have gone. And I'm tired of excusing them away. They are, they are burdening me and holding me down to the ground. Nothing is coming up. I don't even like to think about prayer when I'm in those shoes. Well, the, uh, the solution is here. The blood of the sin offering easiest thing in the world to do if you're willing to lose your pride and trust Jesus is to say, Lord, I'm not making any more excuses about that. That's a sin. That's wrong. I'm a sinner. But thank you that you have died on the cross for me. And listen, you know what happens? You're cut loose from that thing. That doesn't mean that now you're indebted to be perfect and never make a mistake again. It just means, hey, Lord, I'm a sinner. Thank you that you died on the cross for me. I ask your forgiveness for this. Cleanse my conscience. Bam! It's like you're a free guy at that moment. Prayer again is quite easy. What's that verse in James? The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And you know the first person it availeth much for is himself. Wow, I just feel like vroom, I'm lighter than air. Yeah, you took the blood of Jesus the way you were supposed to. And now you got a prayer life. Amazing. Well, all of this shows us in these verses, uh, Exodus 31 through 10, that it is a huge part of our service to God as a New Testament priest to pray. It is a huge part. This is prayer that enters the presence of God, that actually enters into His face. And this is prayer according to the verses in Revelation that get a response with thunder and lightning, etc. It's prayer that works. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with church history. I'm not going to go too far back, but I'm um, going to tell you something about the effectiveness of prayer here for a second. Uh, have you ever heard the name D.L. Moody? Okay, some of you have probably one of the greatest evangelists ever to live on our planet. Okay. He lived in the 19th century, got saved, not born, but saved when he was 1850, well, not when he was, but he got born again in 1855. He was an uneducated shoe store clerk. Spent the rest of his life reaching an estimated 100 million people with the gospel. And this was without radio and television. Just sheer, just get up and go. Well, his great ministry, his mighty ministry, went back across the Atlantic Ocean at one point, because he was American, and uh, went to Great Britain. It seems like that he received an invitation to Cambridge, the Cambridge, you know, where all the smart guys go. All the smart guys, kind of like, you know, all the average guys go to Ohio State. All smart guys, and I'm just kidding. Okay, that, so all, the, all the, the geniuses are there at Cambridge. And then here is D.L. Moody, who's going to go there, and he is uneducated. And according to his autobiography, or according to biographical sources, he was nervous. Because these guys are geniuses. They invent stuff that like actually have meaning. Not tic-tac boxes and stuff like that that actually change things. These are politicians. These are academics. And he is going to go and get in their face, in the, in the, in the face of these guys with the gospel of Jesus. And he is nervous. And um, uh, thankfully, nobody told him that the first night of the revival there on Cambridge, there were a group of extremely intelligent young men that were coming to have a good time. You know what that means, right? You don't go to a gospel revival to, quote, have a good time. 
but they did. And they showed up. Okay, there's a big rowdy group of them. They show up and they rush to sit together. So it says, if they were in this room, all of them rush to sit together here because hecklers love to sit together. They draw on one another's energy. Okay, first thing they do, they choose their chairs and then build a pyramid of chairs in the room. This is right before the gospel is about to be preached. So they're all laughing and carrying on. Somebody sets off a cherry bomb. This is true. Somebody sets off a cherry bomb right out the window of the building, right outside the window. Rattles the windows and all this. And this is before anything's even started. Okay, they begin to sing the hymns because uh, Ira Sankey was the worship leader. He was a tremendous um, singer. Um, he goes out, he starts to sing the hymns, and then the guys begin singing counter pop melodies and folk songs over the hymns. You know, they start, I don't know how it sounded at the time, but I, I heard it was God awful. So they start singing like, Jesus save me, 15% or more on my car insurance, and stuff like this. And, and, and as they were doing that, of course, there was this giggling and laughing and carrying on happening. And then Moody comes out and Moody starts to talk and Moody's got an accent, New England accent. I don't know if he was saying yod and all this, the ka and all this kind of stuff, but they picked up on it and started mocking him where he paused in his preaching. What do you do? And every time he did that, there was giggling and there was snickering and the gospel thrives on people becoming reflective and serious and thinking about their souls. And they weren't being allowed to do that. When I read that in the Moody biography, I thought, man, what would I do? I, I don't know. I'd just pack my bags or I'd get mad or, or something. And, uh, you know, the old Methodist camp riders, you know what they would do. If somebody was heckling, you know, out in the crowd, they would leave the pulpit and just go down there and whip the tar out of that guy. Yeah. And then come back and finish their sermon on God so loved the world. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> Just blood all over his knuckles and all that. So you had to fight and preach back in those days. And I was thinking, yeah, that's what's needed. <laughs> so D.L. Moody went down to the lower level of the facility. And he told the people there, he told his staff, we've, we've hit a wall. You know, they're not serious about anything. So... Somebody there suggested, hey, why don't you call together some of the mothers of these guys? Mothers and grandmothers, get them all together and ask them to pray. Ask them to pray. So they did. They had a prayer meeting. And the moms were crying and they were beseeching and praying for all these smart alecks that they had raised, <laughs> praying for them. To, that their, their hardened hearts would be softened. I mean, their tears, they were crying out, and that prayer went on and on. And you could say the incense went up, buddy. Clouds of it went up. Only a blind God would have missed that. But it went up, up, you could say, according to the, the, the picture, and Revelation went up before God. And let me tell you, the lightning came down. Because the next night, Moody got up, Moody started to preach. And you could have heard a pin drop. One person who sat in that particular meeting wrote about it later on. He said, at that, at, at, during these moments, a curious sort of isolation came over me. And I felt that I was no longer in a crowd of people. And that I was by myself in a huge room. And God was speaking directly to me. He said, there was no escape for me or for my soul. At the end of that speaking, Moody invited people to come forward. And he said, 
Come forward if you would like to inquire as to the state of your immortal soul. And I will help you. I will help bring you to Jesus. I will, I will pray with you. And I'll say, okay, so he did this. And then he said, let anyone who is concerned for his soul come forward right now. And nobody moved. It's just still. So he did it a second time. Nobody moved. He did it a third time. Nobody moved. Finally, the last time, one guy way in the back, some little shrimpy guy, stood up kind of like this and kind of went to the front, all embarrassed, red, red in the face. Because, you know, you lose bad face if you're going to love and follow Jesus in front of all your friends. Oh. So he, he kind of did that. And then slowly... One by one by one by one, the smart Alex all got up and came forward. One by one. Some in tears, some utterly humiliated by the conviction of the Holy Spirit upon them. But they all came. And then this revival continued night after night. And every night, the little spiral staircase leading up to the place where they were talking, to, to, to Moody, was loaded with guys, young British guys, who would one day shape the very fabric of British culture. All there, concerned with hearing about Jesus. What did this come from? Not Moody. Not some speaking expertise. But from a cloud of incense heaved up by some little old ladies. It got up in front of the throne and lightning came back down, changed everything. This is the way we need to think about our prayer. I want you to, matter of fact, do this. Think this way. All right. This is actual myrrh right here. I want you to keep this image in your mind. And please don't ask why your pastor carries around a cigarette lighter. I don't. Okay, this is just for today. But think about it this way, right? Here you are, just doing your best to pray, doing your best, doing the best that you can, and something going up while you're doing this. Something going up. Let this picture stay in your mind. And as a matter of fact, if you feel kind of inconsequential by yourself, get some friends. Yeah, I'm going to stink this joint up really good now. Get some friends. Get some friends to, to, to kind of help you here. Get, get, get a couple of, couple of you know, you can, you can do more than go to movies with your Christian friends. You can actually pray with your Christian friends and get a cloud of incense going up. That's your prayer. Think about it. That's your prayer. All right, what am I going to do with this? Mm, just put Hopefully not. But I want you to think about prayer that way. Now listen, I did say there were two pictures this morning. That's the prayer part. Now, the second one is the Bible. Now, take a look at, uh, go down a little bit farther in the verses. Verse 17, the word of God is crucial to your service. All right, the Lord said to Moses, you shall also make a basin of bronze, a basin of bronze, like a big tub, right? You're going to make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. This is for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar. So if you look at the way this thing's positioned, it's right after the altar here. Now this, this tells us something really important. The placement, again, tells us something incredibly important. That, first of all, remember that the uh, altar of burnt offering is, is, signifies the cross of Jesus Christ and his death for our sins and for us. Right here. But, but notice that according to John chapter 19, verse 34, listen to this. One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and what? Water. The experience of redemption is one of blood and water. 
When you come to Jesus Christ and you believe in him, there's blood for the washing of your sins and there's water too. There's water. Now listen to this. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 tells us what this washing in the water is. He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit washes you. Jesus' blood absolves you, forgives you, justifies you from all sin, and the washing of the water of the Holy Spirit brings regeneration and and renewal. So when we think about this big bronze tub that's out in the altar, that, that, that's close to the altar. That is for the, the Holy Spirit's washing of us, but not of sin necessarily. Listen to this. this. This washing work of the Spirit that you experienced when you believed in Jesus is once for all. You can't undo it, thank God. You can't mess it up. Aren't you glad there's something out there that you can't mess up? It's true. You can't undo the washing work of the Holy Spirit. It's a deep cleanse. It's gotten way down inside of you. You you can't undo it. You can't redo it. But um, you should experience this on an ongoing basis. Um, John 13.10, Jesus said, Jesus was talking to Peter, the one who has bathed does not need to wash. The one who has bathed does not need to wash. You don't ever need to be saved all over again. Even if you got way away from Christ, you do not need to be saved all over again. Thank God. It's, it's kind of like when your kids, you know, um, well, for most of us, our, our children are really small, but your, 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 your child, it's time for lunch, it's time for dinner, you, they, they're ready to eat, you ask to see their what? hands. You don't tell them to go take a shower. You just tell them to go wash their hands because you trust that within the last 24 hours, it's good enough. The bath they took 24 hours ago within the last day, that's good enough. Well, with God, he would say the bath you took when you met Jesus is good enough. It's good enough. You never need to do it again. It's a work of grace. However, you need to wash your hands. Jesus did say here, and, and, and specifically here, feet. The one who is bathed doesn't need to wash except for his feet. Your lower extremities, you see, touch this earth. Comes in direct contact with it. Even if you're not trying to sin, you pick stuff up. You do. Okay, you go to work Monday morning, you had a stellar weekend, great morning and, and, and Sunday service, kind of confusing, but the short southern guy did okay, and you show up on Monday morning, you feel kind of refreshed, and yes, I'm, I, I, I pray a little bit, I'm, I'm good, and then somebody else in the office who does not share uh, your fidelity to Christ wants to talk about what they did over the weekend, and you shouldn't have heard that. And they did it at the water cooler, and you didn't mean to hear it. You just walked up. You walked in the middle of it, and the guy was going on about bearded to swim in, and this is what, I, you know, this, this girl in that situation, and all this. And you're, you're thinking, good grief, I didn't need to hear that. Now I'm going to be thinking about that. Then you go home in the evening, you turn on the TV, you want to decompress after a hard day's work, and you're flipping through the channels, and you saw something you really didn't need to see. And now you can't get the image out of your head. These things are not necessarily your fault. They just happen to you. You know, Jesus, Jesus would say, you don't need to be saved all over again. You just need to wash your hands. Wash your feet. That's all you need. Wash your hands. Wash your feet. Good enough. Okay, if you're wondering how this happens, Ephesians 5.25 Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water in the word. Listen, you need to think of your time in the Bible as being different. As being different than just trying to get some information. Jacob, come up here for a minute. I want you to hold this. Now, we did the incense for the prayer. I want you to think of your time in the Bible this way, okay? 
Think of it this way. This is the laver or the washing of the water inside the Word of God. There is the washing action of the Holy Spirit inside the very words of the Bible. And should you get into them, you begin to wash yourself off. It's, it's like, okay, I got involved in some things today. I just feel icky. I feel dirty. I feel distant from God, even though I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't gambling or anything or, you know, doing drugs or any of that stuff. I just happened to just live in this world. Got in, I got, maybe I got into John 3.16 or something. God so loved the world and he gave his only begotten son. I'm not doing anything special. It's just deep reading. And it's having an effect upon me to where when I'm done and I close my Bible after a few minutes reading, focused reading, I feel like I just, wow, I feel spiffy. <laughs> just, I'm not taking my shoes off and putting my feet in this thing. <laughs> I thought about it. But, but you just feel like, wow, I just, I'm, I'm okay. I didn't have like a, a gigantic spiritual experience. I just exposed myself to the Word. And it had some washing effect on me. This is the power of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. For souls who have gotten kind of far from Jesus during the work day, etc. So I'm going to challenge you to do two things. Thanks, you don't have to keep standing up here. I'm going to challenge you to do two things during this next week. And these should not be like incredibly unreasonable things. But first of all, have five minutes of focused prayer. Focused prayer. Do it tomorrow morning. Because if you say, yeah, I'll get around to it, you'll never do it. Get up tomorrow morning. Have five minutes of focus. You say, wow, five minutes is not a lot. Oh, yes, it is. If you've got a flabby spirit, it is. If your prayer life is flabby and out of shape, five minutes is an eternity. You keep looking at your watch. Is it over yet? <laughs> focus prayer means I pray exercise deliberately to keep my mind from drifting. To keep my mind from drifting. To keep myself from daydreaming. And I focus on the prayer. That's what I'm talking about. Get the fragrance going up. Get the fragrance going up. If you have a hard time knowing what to pray, how about pray something that inspired you from a, from a verse or from a sermon, or something like that, and you just start getting used to the incense going up. Start doing that. Okay, then five minutes of focused Bible reading. Now, some hardcore folks are going to get all over me. You, 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 five minutes, I mean, you're not challenging them at all. Uh, this is harder than you think. I said focused, right? So five minutes of focused Bible reading. You could divvy this up and you could distribute it differently throughout the week. Or you could put them together for a grand total of 10 minutes, right? Of, uh, of focused prayer and Bible reading. Now listen, when you go to read your Bible, I don't know how you do it. Let me make a small suggestion. I'm old school. I tend to think that this is superior in all ways, even from the electronic varieties of the Bible. I'll tell you why. Because while, you're, while you've got this device in your pocket, mine's back there, but while you've got it in your pocket, there's always this feeling like right behind my Bible is all kinds of statuses I need to check. I just need to check. When I handle this, it's not related to anything. It's not related to Instagram, Facebook, FaceSpace, MySpace, Zanga, or any, any uh, smoke signals or any other kind of thing. This is separate from all forms of social media and work. It's separate. So when I handle this, I feel like, wow, I'm handling a product that's outside the Google world. It's away from it. This is the reason why I like hard copy, low-tech Bible reading. Okay? You just get yourself away. Listen, some things that we have learned in today's society are not necessarily good things. And it's the short attention span. And I, I just, I, one guy even said, if I can't check my cell phone, every 45 seconds I feel nervous. 
I just, I, I heard this. I thought, wow, if this is the case, what does a guy do with this? He's finished. He will not be able to tolerate. I mean, five minutes, a guy like that would say, I can't do that for five minutes. What are you, nuts? <laughs> our, gen- our, our, our world has gone crazy. And, and some of these things, when I say focus prayer or focus Bible reading, focus is imperative. You have to have it. Because that's what it takes to actually grow, is you've got to concentrate in on a, s- a subject matter. You've got to. So anyway, I want to, uh, when, I, when I say pray for five minutes, when I say read the Bible for five minutes, basically what I'm saying is get used to a cloud going up and get used to taking a, well, not taking a bath, but washing your hands and washing your feet. Get used to it. Get used to it. Your Christian life and your service life will come up dramatically. Trust me. Don't trust me. Trust the Bible. Anyway, trust the picture there. All right, I'll have some prayer for everybody. We'll stop. Jesus, Lord, I pray for the power of our Christian service and the power of our daily Christian life with just these small things, these these tools that you provided us are awesome. We thank you for the grace that you've given us and the ways in which that we can experience your Father, our Father, your God, and our God. In your name we pray, amen.